hello, everyone, and welcome to Research Ride, a journey from idea to implementation of research programs in the Department of Medicine at Emory University. I am your ride leader, Charlie Searles, and a faculty member in the Division of Cardiology and the Associate Vice Chair for Research in the Department of Medicine. Hey, Sarah. Hi, Charlie. How's your week going? It's going all right for a Tuesday. How about yours? Not bad. What are you working on? Well, right now we are gearing up and planning for the 2024 year of our early career uh, investigator workshop series, Road to Next Success, or R2 Nexus, as we like to call it. Oh, awesome. Yeah, we're looking forward. Our first workshop is coming up next month, and we'll have a few more throughout what's, the year. What's that workshop about? That workshop is on developing a strong research support network. And we've got some great speakers across the department who will be doing panel discussions and lectures for... Very enlightening. Very enlightening. A lot of very important information. I also want to ask how the uh, proposal submission deadline policy is going Let's as go part ahead. of the uh, Ease of Research Initiative. Yeah, so far so good, you know. Otherwise we, known as a PSDP. It will not be known as that, but good try. <laughs> uh, it's going well. I mean, any new policy, you have your ups and downs and you have your bumps, so to speak. But uh, so far so good. So where do, where can one find out about this uh, PSDP? <laughs> The uh, new proposal submission deadline policy is available on the research main page and uh, the Department of Medicine Research Administration page on the website. So easy to find. Very easy to find. So moving along here, um, I wanted to ask you, Barcelona or Real Madrid? <clears throat> Technically neither, but by way of Ronaldo, I'll go Real Madrid. Well, our next guest is a big fan of Real Madrid. Oh, wonderful. And um, he was uh, telling us earlier about uh, you either fall into the Real Madrid camp or into the Barcelona camp, which I guess makes a lot of sense, the two dominant teams in the Spanish first division. Mm -hmm. um, but he's, he's, he was telling us actually, even within his family though, there's some divisions about who roots for Barcelona and who, who roots for uh, Real Madrid. In fact, he was telling us that uh, his uncle was had worked and scouted for uh, yeah, Barcelona, which sounded pretty interesting. Very interesting. I wonder how much of a role he played in the uh, young Messi acquisition huh. way back Could have been part of that I have to follow up dynasty, with him in I guess. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good question. We should have asked him about that. So, um, but, our, but he... And I guess if our listeners haven't already guessed it, it's, it's uh, Dr. Naki Sands is our next guest. And um, it's, it's going to be an interesting discussion. He, um, he studies autoimmune disease. Uh, in particular, he studies B cells. Do you know what those are? Only from what I've gathered in research and prep work for the podcast. Well, hopefully he'll tell us a little bit more about B cells and uh, what their uh, role is in development and progression of uh, autoimmune disease. So I'm looking forward to this discussion. I am ready to learn some new stuff. Awesome. Well, let's get going. Today, we are very excited to be touring with Dr. Inaki Sands, a world-renowned physician scientist and expert in the biology of autoimmune diseases or human immune-mediated diseases, such as uh, systemic lupus erythematous or SLE. At Emory University uh, and Children's Healthcare of Atlanta, Dr. Sands is the Mason I. Lowence Professor of Medicine and Pediatrics. He is the Chief of the Division of Rheumatology. He is the Director of the Lowence Center for Human Immunology, and he is a Georgia Research Alliance Distinguished Scholar in Human Immunology. He is also the co-leader of the Autoimmunity Centers of Excellence and a member of the Immune Tolerance Network Steering Committee and a member of the Immune Tolerance Network Autoimmunity Assessment Group. That's, those are a lot of titles, and I, I hope I didn't miss anything important there. Um, no, that's great. That, that's, a yes. lot of, you wear a lot of hats. That's just perfect. Yeah. Um, Dr. Sands' research is, uh, are, is supported by grants from the NIH, uh, from the Lupus Research Alliance, uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and industry. That's correct, yeah. Welcome, Inaki. No. And um, how about we start the research ride with you, with you telling us a little bit about your research? Yeah, and, and first, thank you for, for having me. Um, 
Yeah, as you said, our research really centers around uh, understanding the biology of B cells, uh, mostly in autoimmunity, uh, how they break tolerance to self antigens, how they become not only autoreactive, but why they are allowed to progress and make uh, pathogenic autoantibodies rather than being silenced by, by normal uh, tolerance mechanisms. And um, so in order to understand that in autoimmunity and, and mostly in lupus, uh, we need to also understand how they work in normal immune responses. That's what takes us to also study uh, vaccine responses many times and just normal responses in general by contrast with the, with the autoimmune responses. And so that's what we do at many different levels. And then we try to uh, apply that knowledge to both better diagnosis, better segmentation of disease. Uh, not every lupus is, is equal. Not um, all patients are the same. That's true for every disease, right? So we try to use this knowledge to segment uh, disease into different groups, and then at the end, obviously, how do we better treat uh, autoimmune disease by targeting the B cells? So to just to back up here a second, um, B cells. Uh, I think we, sh we should give a little bit of background on exactly what the immune, yeah. the basic immuno immunology background. B cells are... Yeah, so B cells are one of the two arms of the adaptive immune system. In other words, you know, when you encounter an antigen, the immune system will respond uh, with a first line of defense that is not antigen specific, that's the innate immune response, and then you will have an adaptive immune response that is specific for the antigen. And the two arms of the adaptive immune system are the T cells and the B cells. And uh, actually, we have the, the, uh, the privilege of having here at Emory uh, Max Cooper, who was the person that initially described the B cells more than 50 years ago when it was not known. Uh, how the immune system functions, right? And they call the reason that they are called B cells as opposed to the T cells that are generated in the thymus, and that's why they are called T, uh, is uh, because they are generated in the bursa of Fabricius in the in the chicken, and uh, and that's the way that Matt. Um, Max got to it. Uh, I mean, he started with immunodeficient patients, but experimentally. He started with chickens. Y yeah, because he was able to uh, morsectomize uh, and the birds and, and, and see that the antibodies uh, were coming from a different part of the immune system. And that's why they are called B from the bursa. Uh, and the B cells make antibodies. And they, in the humans, they circulate in the blood and they're located in... Lymph so, nodes and yeah, so bone the, marrow. And yeah, so the B cells, again, I said that the T come from the thymus, and uh, the B come from the bone marrow. And uh, they develop there, they get then um, uh, selected or differentiate in the uh, secondary lymphoid organs, mostly the lymph nodes and the, and the spleen. And then they differentiate the uh, plasma cells. So the plasma cells are the the ones that actually secrete the antibodies and uh, they tend to localize for long lived responses in the bone marrow as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, one way or the other, the B cell lineage through the plasma cells make the antibodies. So B cells are part of one arm of your adaptive immunity in humans, and that is beneficial. That allows us to uh, live and breathe and, and not get infections or severe infections in this this world, but this changes with lupus patients. Yeah, so the, the, the idea is that, I mean, when you think about it, right, it is phenomenal that we would get, um, say, a new virus coming along that we have never seen. It could be HIV, it could be uh, COVID uh, more recently, and that without having seen those viruses before, we are still able to respond to them. So that's 
the main reason why having this huge repertoire of B-cells, each one of them being different, with the ability to recognize to some extent that new antigen and then evolve through what is called affinity maturation and selection, so that through rounds of encounter with the antigen and replication and mutation and so forth, that original B cell becomes very, very specific and with high affinity for that new antigen or whatever antigen, right? So in a way you could look at this as we have a huge repertoire to be able not only to cover all the immune responses that we need because they are around us, but even things that we haven't seen but are going to come at some point. So there is a huge repertoire there. The price that you pay for that is that a lot of it is autoreactive, right? So... Um, a- antigen, autoreactive autogen, antigens that are... Our own antigen. Endogenous to, yes, your, yes. to your body. Self, self-antigens, right? Self-antigens. DNA and stuff and things like that. And so... The trick is that we have in place a lot of um, checkpoints and tolerance mechanisms so that those autoreactive B cells that could induce autoimmune disease, we make them, but then we censor them, right? So we either eliminate them or we silence them. But they are not actively making autoantibodies that are um, pathogenic. What happens in lupus is that somehow, and there are many, many different ways, and different in different patients is that those mechanisms are not working. And, uh, and then those, they are not working and therefore, um, you know, under a given stimulation, we can generate autoimmunity and lupus patients do. That is fascinating. I wanted to ask you how you got into uh, immunology, rheumatology, study of B cells, lupus, yeah. study of lupus. Yeah, well, that that's a long story, right? But just to be brief. Um, So I trained um, in internal medicine back in Spain, and then I made the decision that uh, I needed to understand disease in a different way, and that for that I needed basic science, and therefore I needed research. That's um, that's the way it happened. And and then for a number of reasons, I ended up I always wanted to move to the U.S. I ended up uh, in Dallas at UT Southwestern with one of the uh, giants of antibody genetics. And um, more than anything else, because that's, he was the only one for reasons that are still unknown to me that actually offered me a job. Uh, but it also happened to be an absolutely incredible place. This is Dr. Capra. This was Don Capra, um, who was a, a fantastic um, um, antibody researcher, and uh, and that was you know very kind to me from every point of view. And then UT Southwestern in general was also a powerhouse of immunology and science, uh, and so it was a great place. So from there, uh, my first research actually was in mouse immunogenetics of antibodies, which was great to learn. But at some point I said, well, I want to understand disease, (laughs) so I need to move into humans, and I wanted uh, less structure uh, or structural research and more functional or biological research. And so the natural step from the antibodies was to go to the B cells and to autoimmune diseases. And so that's, you know, long story short, the way I, I got there. So he, he would be the one who influenced you. I, we asked about who are your influencers or your yeah. mentors, and, and so that would be... Yeah, Don was for sure the, uh, the main one. I mean, Don was an MD. He was not a PhD either. Uh, but he did a lot of immunochemistry and actually protein sequencing uh, of antibodies when he was first at the Rockefeller before moving to Dallas. And, um, and he was one of the giants in the field. So he was one of the two or three yeah. people that were uh, really about to define the mechanisms of antibody diversity or did a lot of that at the protein level. And, I mean, he used to tell this story how they all were very close to get there, uh, three or four groups, and then they went to the 
1980 or something like that, or 78, College Spring Harbor uh, uh, Symposium on, on Antibody Diversity. And <laughs> this guy named uh, Tony Gower got up to do his presentation, and he presented what a few years later was the Nobel Prize huh. for, for uh, doing genetically yeah. um, the, the antibody diversity, right? And while they were still working at the protein level. So, um, so yeah, I mean, he was, again, both because he was an MD and he had gone through all that process of learning science and moving from protein chemistry to the molecular biology and so forth. Um, uh, yeah, that, that was the main influence. Um, That's very fascinating. So after your time with Dr. Capra, you went on to clinical training, or more clinical training. And yeah. rheumatology then was a natural path yes. there? Yes, so because I, I was interested in autoimmune disease and I wanted to do it in humans, right? And so from that point of view, rheumatology was the clinical specialty that made the most sense, right? And uh, so I moved to um, UT in San Antonio. Uh, I had to repeat my, uh, at least part of internal medicine res residency, which it really sets you back, uh, but that's what you need to do. Um, and, uh, and then I did rheumatology and um, then started my own lab, all sort of overlapping with all of that, right? And um, so that was sort of the end, so to speak, of the formal training process. Um, so you, uh, you were able to, get funding and um, support, financial support for your program early on? Yeah, as, as towards the end of my rheumatology fellowship, I got uh, you know a small recruitment package there in San Antonio, and then I believe I got an R21 and an scleroderma foundation thing, although I never really did research in scleroderma. And again, it's one of those things I said before, I don't know why Don gave me an opportunity in Dallas, and I don't know he why. He saw something in you. Yeah, he used to say that, you know, um, physicians that are very committed to research tend to do well. You know, that we tend to get things done. <laughs> that was his take. Huh. Um, and, and there may be something to it. Yeah. Or I um, wanted to ask you, what is the Lowen Center? Yeah, it's actually Mason. It's, it's actually called the um, the uh, Lounge Center. Uh, I mean, it was endowed by um, by the Lounge family um, uh, in two thousand four, I believe. And then what it really is is a um, you know a, a, a center um, that is based in medicine, but with some pediatric faculty as well. Um, to, to do research in human immunology, really. Um, so it's a, it's a way uh, to support that, that type of research. So the Lowen Center um, allows you to uh, bring in other investigators, yeah, build so this um, strong immunology research program at, at Emory in general. Yeah. Um, uh, but then it obviously offers you a number of possibilities. I'm operating money to do more risky projects, uh, to cover people that may not be fully funded at some point or to be competitive in recruiting them um, because you can offer some salary support, right? And the um, Autoimmune Center of Excellence. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Um, so the autoimmunity centers um, were started like maybe 25 years ago or something like that. Um, we are the only ones that have had it for that long. And at some point it became a split between um, uh, clinical centers doing clinical trials and science centers doing science in autoimmunity. And so, yeah, there are about eight between the two categories, and we are one of them. This is an NIH-supported yeah, uh, an NIH, center of excellence. Yeah, um, yeah. And uh, how has that helped your program? I would say that the 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 main 
advantage uh, is twofold, right? One is that um, you get um, very good collaborations, right? And so here in, in Emory, for instance, uh, when I moved here, uh, uh, the Autoimmunity Center of Excellence that I had in Rochester, the university there didn't allow me to take it with me. Um, so we had to recompete I see. two years later, and I did that starting my collaboration with Jerry Boss, uh, which is being um, really one of the highlights for me being at Emory's, being, you know, meeting Jerry and working with him over the years, right? So, um, so yeah, so we recompeted, we got it refunded again, and we just. Uh, we got it refunded, although we don't have the NOA yet, but, you know, just a month ago. Congratulations. For, thank you for another five years, right? So um, so that's one of the big advantages. The other one is that it really gets you into a network of superb scientists around the country, right? So people doing incredible research in yeah. autoimmunity and not only in lupus, but other autoimmune diseases. And it's all those collaborations and just the knowledge that you get from, you know, working with the entire network. A lot of this line of questioning is coming from uh, just me reviewing your, <laughs> your CV and uh, looking at someone who has gone from, uh, you know, a foreign medical grad postdoc in Dallas to you have like a research empire <laughs> you have a i mean you have like big big science research program and and that ma making that transition there seems yeah. remarkable yeah uh thank you um so uh, yeah i mean we've been quite lucky there right so we've been able to get good grants center yeah. grants you know program projects uh, so on and so forth right um it hasn't been i don't think um by design in a way right it's being uh, being alert to the opportunities again it's not like i have a road map right of we need this and the next step is that and it's been more opportunistic it's been more there is this opportunity i remember the first time that the ace rfa came around and we were very young and not established in rochester and i sort of said we should apply you know he felt like this is what we do so let's, yeah. let's compete right and if the shoe fits yeah th th but there was a lot of um I guess skepticism as to we are not ready and all of that. And then I remember that we apply and the review got done and we were talking to somebody. We didn't know he was part of the study section. And we said, yeah, we applied for this ACE. I mean, we'll never get it, right? And then he said, well, you might be surprised. <laughs> so, um, so we did well and, you know, and then we have maintained it over time, right? But that's been the story with, with many things. Uh, uh, one of the keys really is, uh, you know, for, for one thing is what we always say, right? I mean, 90% of success is showing up, right? So, I mean, you, you need to try. Um, but it's, it's the collaborations, right? I mean, I mentioned... Um, uh, Jerry, but, you know, uh, Onion Lean, Pulmonary, right? Um, uh, people outside, although they were with us in Rochester, like Fran Lant and Troy Randall, then they moved to UAB. She was, uh, until now, uh, chair of microimmunology. Uh, I mean, these are great people and good friends, and uh, we work together extremely well. So we have shared like two PPGs and the autoimmunity center with Jerry and on and on, right? And so I think that that is essential, um, you know, if you want to be successful. So very productive collaborations have fueled this rise yeah. in the immunology, yeah. rheumatology, immunology. Yeah. I, and then you have Sam Lim on your clinical side. And then on the clinical side, you know, uh, Sam, that probably uh, he and his operation, I would 
place at the very Who top. was here already when you got yeah, here, right? Yeah, Sam was here already, right? And he had already developed an incredible uh, cohort and research operation in lupus. I placed him and the entire operation at the very top, you know, in the world of lupus, uh, you know, more junior faculty like Avisu, Coach Garashi, that uh, um, not only has a, um, um, one of the premier centers on IgG4 disease, but also, um, you know, got involved in, in lupus. And, and that's from the research side, right, in, in autoimmunity. So, yeah, the, the collaborations and the people is the key. But And the clinical research and the basic research are f- fueling each other, it seems. Is that... They're, they're helping each other here, so like, so like s- samples, right? For the samples that you study, yeah. the human samples, you know, you have. Yeah. <laughs> the, the human samples, which is pretty unique here, but also, you know, the clinical information, um, everything that. Phenotyping. Uh, yeah. And um, so all of that together, and it, and it flows in, in both directions, right? right? I mean, there is no doubt that. For instance, let's say for the immune tolerance network or for the autoimmunity centers, we can and do apply the, the immunological insight into new proposals for clinical trials. But the other way around, there are clinical trials that are underway or are established already, and we will uh, contribute mechanistic studies uh, to those trials to understand better uh, what's going on. This is the secret sauce to uh, a successful research enterprise. As I said, I, I think that obviously the effort, I mean, you know that well, is essential. You, you yeah. have to be persistent. Yeah. You have to go back. You have to do it again on and on, right? You have to be entrepreneurial. But at the same time, yeah, I would say that the collaborations and the, and the uh, clinical cohorts are, are the other components, yeah. Uh, well, congratulations on thank you on your success. Um, let's go back to lupus, SLE. Yeah. How do you diagnose SLE? How does how, how do clinicians diagnose SLE? I mean, obviously, disease. There, there, there are some common uh, common features, right? And so um, most people think about it. It's it's a, it really is a combination of clinical features and laboratory features, right? And uh, there's a number of criteria that people apply, right? Um, and so people have to meet at least four of those criteria. Um, one thing that is missed uh, sometimes is that that's more for really research uh, to ensure that somebody that is enrolled in a lupus trial really has lupus, right? Uh, but it's very useful for clinical diagnosis. And essentially, it's a combination of, again, clinical features and laboratory features. And that, a lot, and then ruling out other diseases, obviously, right? So that's a combination of all of that to diagnose lupus. And uh, it's sort of complicated and misunderstood. Um, and that's why the majority of lupus diagnoses that are made outside rheumatology are not real. So there's a lot of people... Misunderstood. Well, there's a lot of people... I mean, lupus obviously can give you a lot of manifestations, right? Including constitutional ones, fatigue, brain fog, joint pain, and things of that nature. Overlaps with a lot of uh, yeah, and then, other... And then, Clinical. you know, the ANAs that a lot of people use for diagnosis as if it was a, um, a diagnostic. That's anti-nuclear antibodies. Yeah, the, um, sorry, yeah, the anti-nuclear antibodies, right? Um, you know, people use it oftentimes as a diagnostic test, which is not, right? Um, and, uh, and so up to 15% of the population have ANAs, right? Right. Including like healthy blood donors and yeah. things like that, right? And yet, when you do the numbers, right, maybe the, the prevalence of lupus may be one in a 1,000 or maybe one in 1,500 if you are looking at African-American females, right? So you do the numbers, right, uh, 15% positive ANA, but one in a 1,000 patients with lupus 
obviously the pretest probability is very low. Yeah. And so and a positive ANA misdiagnoses lupus many, many times. So it's a combination. It really is a combination. And you said that lupus is a heterogeneous disease. What do you mean by that? Well, so the the, uh, the first level of heterogeneity in lupus is, is very obvious in the clinic, right? I mean, you have patients that have kidney disease, say 60% at some point, but then 40% don't, right? Within the kidney disease, there are many different types of disease, and some patients have one and some patients have another one. Some patients have brain disease. Other patients have hematological disease. So clinically, it's very, very heterogeneous. And uh, then it becomes obvious when you look at them genetically and um, uh, immunologically that there is also a lot of heterogeneity, right? Even with different uh, ancestry, right? Like black patients have with lupus have different genetics than white patients or Asian patients or... You know, and the immunology is also different, right? But even within those groups, um, patients are different from um, from each other. So you can cluster patients that have different immunological abnormalities, um, just as an example. And that then has a lot of therapeutic implications, I suppose. I I would like to say that. It should, and it doesn't yet enough. And what I mean by that is that we really keep treating lupus and doing um, clinical trials based not on those differences, but on very simplistic um, differentiations of whether the patient has kidney disease or or not, for instance. And then we treat, uh, essentially we are not treating patients based on their uh, pathogenic mechanism. We, we are treating all the same, essentially. But that's where you're making great uh, discoveries, I, I suppose. We, we are trying to do that, right? Uh, Directing uh, us towards that. Yeah, I mean, obviously, a lot of people are doing that. Uh, a lot of people are contributing a lot to all of these. We are trying to, to, to do that. And uh, But just to use an example, right, we think that there are patients, for instance, for whom despite of what I said, the, uh, the B cells are not important. And we think that about 15% of white patients uh, um, uh, don't have a major role for B cells or the B cells don't have a major role there and about maybe um, um, 30% in other populations, right? So those are patients in which we think that um, that B cell um, uh, depletion therapies uh, are not going to to really uh, be beneficial, mm. right? I mean, you could say the same thing about interferon, or you know, who. Uh, but we are not using the the immunological information that we have in the lab to adapt the the uh, therapies, uh, and that's for a lot of different reasons, right? Including trivial reasons, in principle, uh, like. You know, will insurance companies pay for a therapy just because you think that you know the mechanism and, you know, they should approve it for that patient? Well, that's not yet happening, right? And then you have the complications of doing extremely large trials that are based on that feature, prove it, and then presumably the insurance companies will approve that drug that tends to be very expensive, right? So... um, but uh, that's where the, the field is moving, and that's what we are trying to do. So th- the problem with patients with lupus is there's two, two issues, or I don't, I'm not trying to be too simplified here, but one is the antigen, you know, the antigen being present and yep. that not being cleared out, and the other is that the B cells are making too many antibodies. So, uh, as you said, it's complicated, right? It's yeah. multifactorial. Yeah. And I, you know, when we get these questions... Forgive me for being oh, too... Oh, no, no, no. I mean, those are the critical questions, right? But when we get these questions or we think about it, we do a lot of hand-waving, yeah. right? Oh, you know, it's the genetics, which it is, obviously, right? That uh, they are more prone to 
a given type of immune response and less prone to tolerance and all of that, right? Is that, is the environment, is the inflammation, is the viruses or whatever it may be, right? So it's all those factors together, right? So, um, so we really don't, we really don't know, right? But it clearly is a, it's a combination of, of all those factors, right? And, um, um, so, you know, as you say, it's the antigen, right? Then it's a given type of immune response with, uh, poor tolerance. And then eventually is the generation of those, uh, autoantibodies. Um, so there are, uh, many different factors really. I want to turn to uh, you, specifically your research, and um, you recently um, won this won the William E. Paul Distinguished Innovator Award. Yeah, and what was the basis of that award? Is it based on some of the exciting work that you guys are doing? In so, the Whitehead building. Yeah, yes. Um, yeah, uh, that's, that's where it comes from. Um, no, a, year, a number of years ago, right, uh, I mean, we realized, we were asking, uh, when you have active lupus, right, you have this influx of plasma cells in the blood, right, that are not supposed to be there, right? They are supposed to be in the tissues, and, you know, um, it was known already that, for instance, about seven days after vaccination, you'll have a wave of plasma cells in the blood that are very specific for the vaccine, right? Uh, but other than that, you just really don't see fluctuations in, in other situations. And what it was starting to be known is that inactive lupus is a massive influx of plasma cells. So there is a lot of systemic immune reactions that are reflected in the blood. That's essentially what it is. And uh, so we started asking, where are they coming from? And the idea has always been that uh, we have a lupus patient has a huge autoimmune memory for those antigens that is being present for years. In fact, lupus patients have the typical autoantibodies more than 10 years before diagnosis. Hmm. So when you study a patient, maybe it's been 20 years that she already has those autoimmune cells. So you would say, okay, what's happening during the lupus flare is that those memory cells get reactivated against the same antigens and that's where the plasma cells are coming from. And part of that is the case, right? But what we saw is that actually a lot of it was coming from new knife cells. So somehow the immune system kept going through waves of activation of new knife cells. Uh, and that was sort of the insight that led to that, to that price and a lot of the research that we do. And the work that you're doing now with um, single cell sequencing yeah. of antibodies, can yes. you just give us a brief uh, overview of that? Yeah, so... Which seems ex incredibly exciting. Yeah, so the, the, um, so the single cell work, the more long-standing one, was about, uh, yes, getting the, the uh, antibody uh, genes that are expressed by any given B cell or plasma cell, um, reconstitute them in vitro as recombinant antibodies, and then identify what do they bind to, you know. Um, so, so that's been going on for more years. Uh, Obviously, the newer research of um, doing multiomics with single cells and doing, you know, transcriptome. It's part of a technological it, evolution there. Yeah, it's, it's, it's just obviously being enabled by technology uh, in the last few years, and that obviously allows you to put together the, you know, reg regulums, really, uh, epigenetic or transcriptional of a given cell with the type of antibody that they are making, right? And then that allows you to say, well, for this type of autoreactivity, you need to engage these transcription factors, these regulums to make that cell progress, not being eliminated and survive, right? And be productive in the wrong way. <laughs> and uh, so that's, that's what that technology now allows us to do. And, and again, you know, a lot of 
what we can do is through um, or learn is through very important collaborations. I mean, Jerry has been one of them. Chris Scherer in microimmunology as well, who is superb at, at uh, all of these. And so, again, having those people around allows us to adapt to to and, and exploit the technology. Multi-omic approach yeah. Yeah. to understanding. Yeah, I think that that's one of the critical things. I mean, we were talking about being more or less successful in, in, in your science operation. I think that not being afraid and actually be very pro- proactive with new technologies. I mean, don't stay in your niche, right? Yeah. If the the world is moving in one direction, try to join them. You know, not blindly, right? Yeah. I mean, sometimes you know, technology for the sake of catch the of, catch the train. Yeah, but but don't be shy. I mean, don't stay behind, right? Well, that was a very nice segue, actually, because uh, some of the questions there's a there's a few standard questions that we have on the podcast. And one of them is, um, what would you tell someone earlier in their career uh, or recommend to someone earlier in their career that you did and paid off for you? I would think of uh, two or three things, maybe three, um, to simplify. One is train in the best possible place with the best possible person. You know, I I mean, it's sort of simple, but sometimes mostly coming from the clinical world, we just look around in our immediate environment and we stay with what's been happening in your division, let's say. And maybe that's not the best or the best for you, right? So I always say, no restrictions, you know, go and do the best science with the best person. That That's the first thing. The second thing is... Um, uh, uh, and at that stage, but also as you try to become independent, get a really good mentor uh, for that next phase of. Um, and then the third one, which is absolutely critical, is you have to find your voice. You have to find your niche and your original question. Don't just um, take the next natural ex- steps or or sort of um, you know. Um, um, for for the questions that you were asking before, or that your boss was asking, or that right. I mean, if you find your own questions, yeah. If you don't do that, I think that success is very hard to to achieve. Certainly with competitive grants, even if you are doing really good science, but if people don't identify that as yours, then I think that your chances yeah. of of competitive success and funding are are very low. And then number four was actually embrace technology, right? That was the, that well. <laughs> if I yeah, if we do more, I would say collaborations. Yeah, and through collaborations or otherwise, yeah, I mean uh, embrace technology. Yeah. So the flip side of that is what? What is one thing you did early in your career that you would advise people not to do? Young investigators or early career investigators not to do. The two things I would say one is that. Uh, the same way that I said that Don was a great mentor as a postdoc, then when I sort of left and became more independent, I didn't really get or or seek even uh, uh, a mentor for the next phase. So I think that that was a mistake. And again, part of that was just not understanding. For your clinical training. Well, for the clinical and, and just for the independent career, you know, once yeah. I started my lab, right, I did yeah. not, you know, seek or somehow. You always need a mentor. Yeah, I think so. And, and, and uh, you know, the science and the ideas is one thing, right? But I, I also think it's the logistics, right? I mean, what do you need? I yeah. mean, you need this paper, you need this grant, you need, uh, I think that that is critical. And uh, so that, that probably was the, um, I would say the the main thing. The other one, I would say, I'm by nature. Um, I mean, I'm ident- I identify very much with Larry David, right? So, uh, <laughs> really, yeah, I'm very bad at uh, stop and chat. You know, <laughs> as he says, I don't. Uh, so I don't network naturally, you know, and I think that. Um, that to network naturally uh, is important, or, or if you are not a natural at that, just force yourself to 
network to, you know, yeah. yes, that type of thing. So I, I would say that those probably are the, uh, the main things I would do differently. Push yourself to network. Or, yeah, push uh, yourself to network. And um, um, yeah, I'm, I'm find a good mentor for each phase of your career. Yeah, honestly, I think that that applies to division chiefs or department chairs. You know, yeah. I mean, it's a different job. It's a different set of skills, yeah. right? And it probably is good uh, to find somebody who's done it and uh, tell you what Ask to questions. do. questions. And what not to do, yeah. yeah. Um, we also like to ask about uh, what you do outside of the research lab. And what I neglected to in, to provide in the introduction was the fact that you are an Olympian, that you competed in the 1980 and 1984 Olympics yeah. in judo. Yes. And um, I guess my the question I have is, are you still going to the dojo? Yes, I do. I, um, I mean, not much and not very well, <laughs> but I do. Um, certainly Saturdays, if I'm in town, I'll be there. And then if I can get uh, um, an evening during the week, I'll, I'll try. That gets harder and harder. Uh, you know, There's so. one in, in uh, a, do, a judo there are a number of them. Club is a judo well, they, team? Yeah, there is a number of them, although, uh, you know, unfortunately, judo has declined in the U.S., and, and you don't find a ton of it. Um, but there, there are some, and there is a particular group here in town that is uh, unbelievable in terms of people and friendship and, you know, the, the, um, the person running the dojo, Leo White, that is a former like 14 times light heavyweight uh, U.S. champion and twice Olympian, and he's fantastic and, and has a great place there. So, what are your Olympic memories? Are are they what was what are the what are the highlights of your Olympic well, career? Yeah, well, it's it's a it's a sort of a loaded question. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I mean, obviously, are very unique. Yeah, uh, yeah. very very strong, right? But you know. Um, my highlight or my best memory was a very successful Olympics in, in Moscow, uh, where you know I got to fight for the uh, bronze medal and finish fifth. So as I say, I lost. <laughs> and and it's interesting. Depending on the day, you say that was great, and other times it's like, how could you lose? <laughs> and, uh, and that stays with you, believe it or not. And then, yeah, yeah. and then the next one in LA was a more, uh, much more sour experience. Uh, you know, I was in the hospital. I was injured. Uh, it didn't go well, right? So that that's not a great memory. Really. The Los Angeles Games. Yeah, yeah. So we have a research ride playlist that we're uh, developing, growing, and our guests each time will help us with yeah. some songs on that playlist. Okay. What would you What would you contribute? Well, what I listen to is very eclectic, but I would say um, you know anything but um, Taylor Swift or Bad Bunny. Uh, no, I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm I'm kidding. Uh, That's fantastic. <laughs> but um, no, I mean, Naki Sands is in Taylor Swift. I love that. <laughs> um, so, no, seriously, um, I don't know if I had to, I mean, I would certainly If go. your sons heard you say that, would they? <laughs> they would, they, would, they would cringe. Yeah, they would know <laughs> that, I'm, that I'm totally joking. Uh, um, no, um, seriously, anything by uh, Leonard Cohen. Oh, nice. So, and if I had to pick one or two, I would, I love, uh, well, I, no, that's so over. <laughs> Played too much. Yeah. No, I would say I'm your man. Oh. It's a great song. Yeah, nice. And, um, and, um, everybody knows. Yes. Uh, which is a, a, yes. a fantastic song. Yes. But almost anything by, by Leonard Cohen. Oh. Uh, you know, being very um, conventional there, I think that, you know, American Pie is uh, something that, you know, uh, it has to be there. Yeah, okay. And um, I don't know. Um, Don McLean, American Pie. Don McLean, yeah. American Pie. Okay, you know, good. Great song. And um, 
I don't know. I like so many things, but Harry Nilsson. Mm. Um, wow, you know. Um, yeah. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know. They, they are way too many things, right? But I mean, those are some. No, some, but that would. Those facts. are great contributions to our playlist. Actually, thank you very much for so, that. Yeah. Um, well, I think. Uh, this is going to wrap up our research ride. Uh, Dr. Sands has an appointment that we're <laughs> making him late for. So, Anaki, Dr. Sands, uh, thank you so much for joining us today and giving us this awesome tour of your research program. Thanks for joining me on another great research ride. Producers of this podcast are Sarah McClellan and Ben Searles. Ben is also the editor of this podcast. Theme music composer is Hannah Searles. This has been your ride leader, Charlie Searles, and I will see you next time.